Today's topic is algorithmic mechanism design. Uh, and we'll start with uh, sealed bid second price auction. Auction. And let's uh, again go back and try to look at the properties of uh, this auction. So the first important property is because it is a, a VCG mechanism with Clark pivot rule type payment option. Uh, it's actually truthful. Being truthful is incentive compatible in weekly, do and it's also a weekly dominant strategy. So truthful is a dominant strategy incentive compatible. So being truthful is weekly dominant strategy and uh, that's called incentive compatibility because you are being truthful. Okay, so uh, it's DSIC. The second thing that I haven't emphasized so far is that it's also welfare, welfare maximizing. And what do I mean by welfare maximizing? Well, basically the item goes to the person with maximum value. Okay, so how do we, I mean this is something we understand, right? So everybody bids, whoever bids the maximum gets the item. So how do we write it? as a welfare maximization problem, well, we can assume that xi is in 0, 1, okay, i equals 1 to n, and we want to maximize summation of vi xi, i equals 1 to n, such that summation of xi is equal to 1, i equals 1 to n, right? So this is this is the total welfare. Okay, this is the total welfare, sum of the values of every individual who is participating in this auction. And this is the total number of price, the total number of items. That are being auctioned off. Okay. So you have one item that you want to auction and you have multiple bidders whose values are vi. And so, uh, so the total welfare is summation of vi multiplied by xi, but since there is only one item, you can give it to only one person, okay? So summation of xi has to be equal to one. And xi lies in discrete set, zero comma one. So that's called welfare maximization. So se sealed bid second price auction has this welfare maximization property so that, what that means is highest bidder gets the item, others don't get anything, okay? And the third thing is, which again we haven't emphasized, uh, I mean I haven't em emphasized that property so far, is that it's easy to compute. Easy to compute allocation rule and payment rule, right? So allocation, so who gets the object? Well, the highest bidder gets the object. That's easy to, uh, easy to uh, that's, that's an easy to implement algorithm. And who has to pay how much? Well, the highest bidder pays the second highest price, everybody else pays zero. Again, easy to compute payment rule, okay? So if you want to implement an auction in, uh, let's say in Google or Facebook or, or Yahoo or Bing or Amazon Cloud, it has to have, I mean, not it has to have, but it's good to have these properties. You know, DSIC, dominant strategy incentive compatible, so everybody is going to be truthful. Welfare maximizing, so you are going to produce the maximum value for the bidders. And easy to compute allocation rule and payment rule. So you don't have to think a lot, or you don't have to do a lot of data crunching or solving a lot of optimization problems in order to figure out how to allocate objects and how to 
process the payments. So today's class, the emphasis is we want to maintain this property. Uh, so we, we are going to study a few set of auctions where we want to maintain the DSIC property, uh, which, is, which is really important. But we can sort of relax the welfare maximization. Uh, we want to relax the welfare maximization property. But we still want to make sure that it's easy to compute allocation rule and payment rule. Okay, we don't want to make we want to we don't want to make uh, come up with an auction uh, come up with an auction where it takes exponential time to allocate the object or it takes exponential time to compute the payment. Okay, so we want everything to be polynomial time so that it can easily run uh, on a usual machine. Okay, so this is the one we can relax. Okay we would like to relax we would like to relax this uh, we still want to make sure that we have this property easy to compute rules and we want to make sure that uh, the auction design is uh, uh, dominant strategy incentive compatible okay any questions so far yes uh, is maximum, is over maximum is over xi x1, xn, where xi lie in 0, 1. Okay. Well, yes? The maximization problem we have is summation di, and then summation xi is... Is a constraint. If you can sell more than y. Right, so you will change it to m. Yeah, so does this mean you can sell them a different process for every person? Uh, so clinching auction was an example of that. I didn't cover the clinching auction in details, but there you have M items that you want to give to multiple bidders, so you have some sort of descending price. So you keep reducing the price. Uh, so everyone who has a higher value for the, whose value is greater than the price will take one item, then you reduce the price, then somebody else will take the item. And so the prices for the same item will be different across time okay yeah so yes in that case you will have different prices for the same object identical object but different prices across time so so in order to uh, get to where we want to go uh, I'll talk about Meyerson's lemma lemma for single parameter auction okay so single parameter auction means each uh, each uh, uh, buyer only bits vi okay so that's only one parameter okay it's just a real number um, that's it So the idea is, uh, so let's, let's talk about the first definition. So F is so, so allocation rule Fi that maps V1 to Vn to R. Okay, so how many items, how many items the bidder I is going to get? So that's the allocation rule, and then you have P I, which maps V1 cross V N to R, which is the payment rule. Okay, so what is the payment of player I? So we want to come up with these allocation rules and these payment rules that are computable in in uh, in polynomial time so the so that's what we want to get this is the payment rule this is more of a recap rather than definition so the next definition is fi is monotone allocation rule 
if for fixed v minus i f i v i v minus i is non decreasing in v uh, in v i okay so i'm assuming that all other players uh, bids are fixed it's v minus i and if i increase my bid then i should get more i should be allocated more item okay uh, you know in this in whatever i am going to write i'll write vi uh, but you know i want to make a distinction distinction between vi which is the actual value and bi which is actual bid of the player and of course the if if the auction is dsic then bi will be equal to vi but in general bi which is the bid might be different from vi okay so bi is the bid vi is the value okay and we have seen cases for instance in sealed bid first price auction the bid is lower than the value that the individual has so this is a monotone allocation rule so that's first definition and the second is f1 to fn is implementable implementable allocation rule if there exist p1 to pn such that bidding truthfully with ts i c dominant strategy incentive compatible okay so there exists a payment rule so allocation rule is implementable if there exists a payment rule or a set of payment rules such that bidding truthfully is dominant strategy incentive compatible okay so we need these three definitions for introducing myerson's lemma any question so far yes so remember in the vcg mechanism if you remember uh we had an we had an allocation rule and we also had so and we also had payment rules right so that bidding truthfully was dsic right so uh so this is a definition it's not a result okay so in vcg mechanism it that was the result there exists a allocation rule and payment rule so that bidding truthfully is dc D dsic so once you fix an allocation rule okay remember that allocation rule is some algorithm running in the background so once you fix the allocation rule you also have to come up with a payment rule right and you want to make sure that once you design the allocation algorithm your payment algorithm should be such that truthfully bidding truthfully is dsic so you mean if, if i can find that the uh, payment rule i should implement that uh, allocation probably you should change your allocation function okay um you see you know ideally we want dsic but even more ideally we would want to make sure that the entire system is very simple okay we 
you know, this is all under the assumption that everyone is rational and can make a lot of, do a lot of optimization in their head and figure out what to do. Okay, that's not the case with human beings. Okay, but still, the entire theory has been developed. The entire theory of games has been developed assuming that individuals can make all those calculations and take actions accordingly. Okay, so being simple is good. Okay, being simple is good. If you can, even through a simple bid, uh, or through, through a simple mechanism, if you can be DSIC, that's even better. That's the best thing that can happen. Okay, so sealed bid second price auction was one such mechanism. It was very simple, and it had DSIC property. So, Meyerson's lemma, which actually should be a theorem, but maybe it's a lemma, I don't know. Uh, so A, F is implementable if and only if F is monotone. Okay, I'm, I'm considering F as the collection F12, Fn. Okay, and same thing, I'll use P as a collection P1 to Pn, okay, payment rule. That's an if and only if condition, so that's important. And the second is, if F is monotone, this implies that there exists a unique payment rule such that F P is DSIC. Okay, so now I'm not going to write bidding truthfully is DSIC and all that. I'll just write FP is DSIC and you should understand, fill in the blanks, what it means. Okay, and what is my PI? PI of VI, V minus I is going to be equal to integral zero to VI, Z, DFI over DZ, V minus I, DZ, okay? Now you might argue that, well, you know, if I need not be differentiable and so on, and I will say, well, consider it as a measure and you can do all that fill in the blanks thing, okay? Okay. Actually, uh, let me write it in a simpler format. This is summation i equals j equals 1 to l. l can be any index zj multiplied by jump in fi z v minus i at zj. Okay, so if you if you had bid, so you fix the bid of other players to be V minus I. If you bid ZJ, how much more are you allocated at ZJ? Okay, so your allocation rule will probably look something like this. This is your, this is my FI of Z, V minus I, and this is my Z. So this is your Z0. This is your Z1, Z2, Z3, right? So you multiply Z0 by this one, this number, Z1 by this number, Z2 by this number, add it all up, that should be your payment, okay? So what should I write it as? Let me, beta, have we used beta? Yes, we used beta before. Okay, um, so if this is, this is, uh, what name should I give it? Uh, CI, no, C, not CI, DI, EI, FI. No, FI is already used. Well, let me give it a CI. 
okay but this is only for this particular case so this is my c2 this is my c1 this is my c3 this is my c0 and so on okay so this is So the payment is Z0, C0 plus Z1, C1 plus Z2, C2 plus Z3, C3 and so on. That's the payment. Okay. So why is this uh, important? Well, the whole idea of uh, having a DSIC mechanism boils down, so because of Meyerson's lemma, it boils down to coming up with a monotone allocation rule. Because if you can come up with a monotone allocation rule, you can come up with a payment, okay? So you can come up with a payment so that bidding truthfully becomes DSIC, okay? So Meyerson's lemma establishes the equivalence between these two, uh, these two properties, okay? You know, this seems like an easy property to understand, right? It's monotone, so if I bid higher, I should get more number of items. I understand it, okay? That's easy to understand. But the fact is, just this alone allows you to have payment rule such that you have this DSIC property. So that's really good. So then all, so then your entire problem boils down to coming up with an allocation rule that can run in polynomial time. Okay, any question? Okay. Let's talk about knapsack auction. Let me delete this side. You know, but when I say that all you have to come up with the monotone allocation rule, you have to realize that maybe this integral is hard to compute or something. Okay, so that's something that TBD, okay, we'll discuss when the time comes. So NAPS. And the setting is as follows. Let's say you are starting your next big TV show. And in between your show, your show may be running for 50 minutes. So in between your show, you want to put 10 minutes of advertisement. Okay, so, and so what you do is, well, you go out to the, to the advertisers and then you say that, you know what, I have 10 minute slot that I can put advertisements on. You tell me what's the length of your advertisement and how much you are willing to pay for it. Okay, and then I'm going to make sure that whatever, the advertisement time will go to the people who bid the maximum. So how do you, uh, how do you solve this as a problem? So you have VI, that's the value, valuation of bidder I, and WI is the size, or yeah, size, size of bidder I, okay? So WI could be the number of items the bidder I wants or the length of the advertisements and so on. And then your F of V I V minus I, or rather I don't want to write it as F, but your allocation rule. So, or rather welfare maximization Problem is, I want to minimize or maximize summation of VI 
x i i equals 1 to n <coughs> i x i in 0 comma 1 okay for all i and then you have this constraint such that summation w i x i is less than equal to capital W. This is your budget. I equals 1 to n. Okay, so this is the 10 minutes window that you have for putting in all the advertisements. This is the time uh, of advertiser i, the time of that particular advertiser's video. Okay, and x i is just 0, 1. So whether you are going to schedule that advertiser or not. Okay. That's the problem. <clears throat> Is this problem easy to solve? Well, for five or ten dimensional, yes. But for higher dimensional, this is a difficult problem to solve. Okay? It's uh, similar to bin packing kind of problem. And uh, they are combinatorially uh, I mean, there is a combinatorial explosion in the number of steps that is needed to solve this problem. So very difficult to solve. So no matter, so even though you have, okay, so even though you can do, technically you can do welfare maximization and you can run a VCG mechanism, uh, it's very hard to compute the allocation rule. Okay, so the allocation rule will come from this and then you will have a, a, what was the other thing? The payments. The payments will come by solving this problem by removing bidder i and then solving it and then seeing how much the difference in total value is. Okay, so there is, uh, there is a lot of problem with computing the allocation as well as payments using the VCG mechanism. So you might want to come up with something else. So here is a greedy heuristic to solve this problem. So I want to write that VCG is difficult. VCG computationally difficult. Okay, so if you have to run this auction on a every second basis, you probably won't be able to run it. So now you want to come up with the greedy heuristic. So here you assume that bidders are such that V1 over W1 is greater than or equal to V2 over W2 is greater than or equal to Vn over Wn, okay? And then you pick the, pick the highest K uh, bidders. You know, but I don't want to say highest k because you see how the highest k is decided by the ratio of vi over wi, okay? So not the original valuation. So pick the highest k bidders such that summation of w i x i i equals one to k is less than equal to capital W, which is less than summation of i equals 1 to k plus 1 w i x i. Well, actually x i is equal to 1, right? So I'll just remove x i from here. Okay, so this is a heuristic. So this is a heuristic that's an allocation rule. So this is an F, this is an F, and it runs in polynomial time. It's easy to run this allocation rule. It's difficult to solve this problem and come up with an allocation rule, but it's easy to solve this problem because it's a heuristic, and this is the allocation rule, the new allocation rule that is easy to compute. Now it so turns out uh, I mean, you have to work for it, but you can show that this allocation rule is monotone. 
okay this allocation rule is monotone so So it turns out F is monotone. Okay, so if you fix other people's bid and if you assume that one of the bidders started bidding a higher price, so VI increased, he increased its own VI, he didn't change his WI. WI is something that's given, okay, that's the size of the bidder I, that's not part of the bid of the bidder. Okay, so the length of the advertisement is something that has already been decided. I mean, there is no bidding about that. So if one person increases its VI, it's natural that he might become the highest or the second highest bidder at some point of time and therefore be allo allo allocated a place in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, heuristic. And therefore, F turns out to be monotone. So if you fix the bid bids of other players, if you increase your own bid, you will be allocated the good at some point of time. Okay, This is 0, 1, so you will jump only from 0 to 1. You will never jump from 0 to 0 0.5 to 0 to 1 to 2 to 3. Okay. So since F is monotone, there exists a payment rule such that FP will become dominant strategy incentive compatible, in which case each bidder is actually going to bid the true value. Okay, So, so VI is going to be, so BI is going to be equal to VI. So F is monotone implies from Meyerson's lemma that there exist P1 to Pn such that the mechanism is DSIC. So that's good. Fact 2. Remember, we started with this idea that we want to have DSIC property, we want to have welfare maximization property. And we also want to have easy compute. The allocation rule and payment rule should be easy to compute. In this case, the allocation rule is easy to compute. From Meyerson's lemma, we can compute the payment rule. And actually, it's not terribly hard to compute. And that's also DSIC. So we get two properties. What about welfare maximization? What happens to that? This was the welfare maximization problem. So what happens to that? Well, it turns out that if everyone bids truthfully, then heuristic welfare is greater than or equal to half of maximum welfare. OK? So the welfare under this policy, greedy heuristic, is going to be greater than half of this. This is the maximum welfare. So whatever this is, this turns out to be. OK. Okay, so if you were living in the VCG world, you would break your head trying to solve this problem so as to get the dominant strategy incentive compatible. But if you thought from a computer science perspective, you realize that, well, this is not this is difficult to solve, so let's do the greedy heuristic and see what we see, what we find. Well, you find that the way you have arranged this greedy heuristic, you have come up with an allocation rule that is monotone. 
Meyerson's lemma gives you payment rules that induces everyone to be truthful. And it turns out that if everyone is going to bid truthfully, then the welfare is going to be greater than or equal to half of the maximum welfare. So there is some guarantee about welfare of the bidders who are participating in this auction. Okay? And if you think about it, if you're Google or Facebook or you know, a big company like that, welfare of the participants is your top priority. Okay? If, you're, if your customers who are advertising on your platform are not happy, you are screwed. Okay? So you want them to be happy, and this is the happiness index. Okay? So, so that's the key, uh, the, the key uh, contribution of this particular heuristic. Okay? Of course, you, don't, you shouldn't think of it as this is, the, this is the result in the whole of algorithmic mechanism design. I just want you to present, I just want to present the ideas that are out there so you can come up with your own heuristics in the future for your own companies that you will form and earn billions of dollars. And donate it to Ohio State. And maybe to me as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. How do we get that it's greater than half the maximum? I mean, you have to do the computation. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to be straightforward. Yeah. There's a lot of lot of arguments in there. I don't want to cover that in the class. Okay. In the, do I have time? Seem to have time, okay. So, the next thing is the wealth, uh, the revenue maximization. So, so far we talked about welfare maximization, but maximum welfare need not be maximum revenue. Yes. Can we start? Yeah, you can try. But what will you get? Will it be faster then? Will it be faster? Hmm. I don't quite know. You know, because for these class of problems, it's not clear in which direction you would go uh, so as to maintain the constraint and at the same time maximize the objective. Yeah, I don't know. The other thing you should know is Remember that Meyerson's lemma require f to be monotone. Let's say you started with the solution of this problem. You plugged it in here and you started solving this optimization problem. The resulting f, okay, you're changing the allocation rule. The resulting f needs to be monotone, okay, and also needs to run in polynomial time. So the reason why such heuristics are easy is because proving that f is monotone is easy. If you start plugging it in here and running the algorithm, uh, I think most likely you will lose this monotone property. Okay. Now, you might argue that, you know what, even though I'm saying that this is a very difficult problem to solve, you probably can uh, come up with an epsilon optimal, an algorithm that computes the solution with some sort of optimality guarantee. The problem with that kind of allocation rule is also that you cannot prove that it is monotone. So what then you have to do is you ran the algorithm, you computed the allocation, then you tweak the allocation a little bit so that you come up with a monotone allocation. Then you can apply Meyerson's lemma and induce a dominant strategy, incentive compatible uh, strategy for all the uh, buyers. Okay. So, so far we have talked about welfare maximization, but the fact that Google has become big and Facebook has become big is not because, well, it's also because they are maximizing welfare, but it's also because they are maximizing revenue. Okay, so that's also important. So let's talk about uh, revenue maximization for some time.
Okay, so the setting is as follows. Uh, so let's start with an example. One item and one bidder. And the bidder's value function is the i. Oh, sorry, the one. Okay, there's only one item and one bidder. Let's say you wanted to do social welfare maximization. How would you, how would you give the item to the bidder? If you wanted to do social welfare maximization, what would you do? Give it to him for free, right? So if vi is greater than equal to, sorry, v1 is greater than equal to zero, give the item for free. If v1 is less than zero, uh, don't, don't sell. Okay. But then this is not good, right? Because what's the revenue? What's the, I mean, you did social welfare maximization, but what's the revenue? Zero. Okay, so it's not in your best interest to to do this uh, to do this auction to conduct this auction. So what would you do? Let's say you were the seller, you had one item, and there was only one person standing in front of you. What would you do? You would want to quote him a price. So if you want to do revenue maximization, you would want to quote him a price, him or her a price that's just slightly lower than V1. Okay, so. In which case, the buyer would still buy it, right? So you have to somehow, uh, so, so buyer will buy it because your price is lower than, lower than the value that the buyer has. Okay, so somehow, me as a seller, I have to do some sort of simulation in my brain about what the expected value of the person who is at my doorstep, what's his expected value going to be, and then decide the price according to that expected value. Okay, and in that case, I might earn some revenue with certain probability, I might not earn revenue with certain probability. Okay, so the expected revenue is going to be something. But at least the revenue in that case is going to be positive. Okay, it's not going to be equal to zero. So in some sense, I am maximizing my revenue by doing this slightly complicated calculation about what the value of the person standing at my door is going to be. So let's take that idea a little bit further and talk about it in the general setting. So I have one item and n bidders. And I want to do revenue maximization. And the goal is to get the maximum revenue. So what's the expected revenue? So f is the allocation function, or f1 to fn is the allocation rule, and p1 to pn is the payment rule. Okay, so the idea is to come up with f and p so that the revenue is maximized. So what is the expected revenue? Well, it's expected value of summation of i equals 1 to n pi of v. Okay, again I'm assuming that the bids are truthful, okay, because if the bids are not truthful, then V has to be replaced with B, the actual bids. I did not assume the, uh, the value, valuations of the bidders, so, well, let me, uh, sorry. I have to introduce, so vi is distributed according to gi, okay, so gi is the CDF, cumulative distribution function, and gi will be the PDF, which is the uh, probability distribution function, okay? And so the expected, so you came up with the allocation rule and the payment rule, so the expected payment so expected revenue is i equals 1 to n pi of 
v i v minus i, right? So that's the total expected payment, and that's the revenue that you're going to make. So you want to maximize this, this function. But remember that Meyerson's, if you could come up with a monotone allocation function, then the payment function becomes a function of the allocation function itself. And so you can potentially transform this expected payment to something which is a purely a function of the allocation rule itself. Okay, is that, is that clear? Okay, so we want to transform this equation in such a manner that PI, so this expected payoff or expected revenue is going to be written as something which is a function of the allocation rule itself, F1 to Fn. So in order to do that, let me say, let me define virtual valuation, which is phi i v i given by v i minus 1 minus g i v i over g i v i. Okay, so what is this virtual valuation? Well, this is the true value minus the information rent, okay? So this is known as the information rent. In some sense, this is the cost of acquiring the information about the valuation of the bidder. Okay. So what's the result? The theorem is if FP is DSIC, so dominant strategy incentive compatible, this implies that expected summation of PI of V I equals one to one to N is the same as expected value of summation i equals 1 to n pi of v fi of v okay so if you could come up with a monotone allocation function you can come up with a payment mechanism from uh, from the Meyerson's lemma. And so the expected revenue, so this is the expected revenue, right? This is the revenue. The expected revenue can be purely written as an expected value of the virtual valuation multiplied by the allocation rule. So in the previous auction so far, we said, well, my welfare Welfare is equal to VI XI, where XI is essentially FI of V, right? In this case, I am saying that, you know what? I cannot use the true value here. I have to use this virtual valuation. So I have this virtual valuation here, which depends on the valuation. Oh, this is purely a function of VI. It's not a function of any other V. So this is purely a function of VI. So this is the virtual valuation multiplied by the allocation function itself, okay? And you take the expected value. Okay.
So what's a what's an upshot of this particular theorem? Well, if you want to maximize the revenue, you have to come up with a monotone allocation function fi that maximizes the expected, not the expected, but that maximizes the virtual valuation. Okay. Uh, Rather, I, I should say that the welfare function, the total welfare has changed uh, because of this virtual valuation term here. So how do we go about proving this result? This, this expectation is taken with respect to V1, which is distributed according to G1, V2, which is distributed according to G2, V3, which is distributed according to G3, and so on. So in the previous class, we had assumed that each of these GIs are the same. Right, so it was a symmetric auction. Now we have removed that assumption. So none of the GIs are the same. They can be all different, but they are independent. So V V one is independent of. So V i is independent of V j i not equal to j. Okay. So how do we how do we prove this result? Well, so let's look at pi, vi, v minus i. What was it equal to? It was equal to integral of 0 to vi, z, fi prime, z, v minus i, dz. You know, if I write fi prime, you might confuse it. So let me write it as a gradient with respect to z. So it's not a gradient with respect to any other valuation. So that's my payment. So let's compute the expected payment. This is expected with respect to VI. VI, V minus I. So what is this equal to? So well, I'll just take the outer expectation 0 to V max of I, then integral of 0 to VI, Z, fi dz multiplied by gi vi dvi. Okay, so this is the payment. This is the payment, and I'm taking the expected value of the payment with respect to vi. Okay, I'm fixing v minus i as constant, so that's not changing. So you see this, this, this problem has a very, very nice structure. So this is some function, that's fine. So you are integrating with respect to z and then you are integrating with respect to vi. But you're not integrating, so these two variables are not independent because z ranges from 0 to vi and then you are having an outer integration with respect to vi. Okay, so you can apply what is known as Fubini's rule. Okay, interchange this integral in a specific fashion, do some change of variables, do integration by part, and then what you get is zero to V max I of phi I Z F I prime Z Okay, so this phi i z actually comes from integration by parts of the z and interchanging the way this integration is happening. Uh, so that's why you have a form that looks something like this, okay? Fubini's rule and integration 
by part. Okay, so those of you who are good in calculus would love solving this at your home. Okay, and then you sum it all up and you get this expression. Okay, you sum the payment, the expected payments of all the players, take an outer expectation with respect to V minus I, sum it all up, you get this expression. Okay. So far, so good. So we wanted to maximize the expected revenue. We want it to be dominant strategy incentive compatible and and what else? Uh, yeah, we wanted everything to be computable in, in uh, real time. So the next result, uh, so the next definition is GI is regular if Pi is non-decreasing. Okay, so this is the definition. What is a regular CDF? Well, Pi should be non-decreasing. Okay, so if you have a uniform distribution between 0, 1, then Pi is non-increasing. Okay, why is that? So let's say Gi is Gi of Z is equal to 1 for all z in 0 comma 1 then this means that phi i of z is equal to z minus 1 minus z over 1 which is 2 z minus 1 so this is increasing well this is strictly increasing so it is definitely non decreasing and so g is regular so uniform distribution is regular and the theorem is G1 to Gn regular implies virtual welfare maximization gives max revenue. Okay, so virtual, rev virtual, so this virtual welfare maximization is the same as maximizing the total revenue. Okay, so of course you want your F to be monotone so that this payment function makes complete sense. So you want to make sure that you come up with a monotone, uh, a, a monotone allocation rule. So in that case, the virtual welfare maximization will actually give you the maximum revenue. I, I wonder if they have actually given, if the book has some allocation rule as part of the proof. No, it doesn't have a, so this book doesn't have, has the proof, so I, I don't know whether such a monotone, so they, whether they have a monotone F or not. Okay, but anyways, this is, this is the main result here, okay? So, if you want to maximize revenue, you don't have to come up with the allocation rule that maximizes the expected welfare. You have to come up with a allocation rule that maximizes the expected virtual welfare okay that's the important thing here yes under dsic it's like already equal right i mean this gives another like that's right more yeah. yeah 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 i think it has something to do with the fact that fiz is non decreasing so if you come up with a monotone allocation or rather it should have that if phi is non-decreasing then there exists a monotone allocation rule. Yeah, for 
and then you essentially use this result. Okay. But now the question is whether this sort of complicated payment mechanism and the complicated rule is good. Well, you would really want to see something which is simpler, okay, not so complicated. So let's go back to our original problem. We wanted DSIC. So probably we can get that through a monotone allocation rule if it exists. Um, so DSIC is good. We can get, we don't want to maximize the social welfare, we want to maximize the revenue here. And the third thing was computability. It seems like this sort of integrals and whatnot might be difficult to compute. So let's try and come up with something simpler, okay? A simpler mechanism that can guarantee the expected revenue in some sense, okay? We won't get the maximum revenue, but we'll get it something close to the maximum revenue, okay? But using a simple mechanism. So the goal is find simpler mechanisms. But with guarantee. So find simpler mechanisms with revenue guarantee. Okay, so that's our next next problem to tackle. Any questions so far? Okay, everything is clear. You know, one, one uh, important thing that we, we, of course, we haven't talked, it, talked about it, but we'll probably talk about it in the last class, is this idea of bounded rationality, okay? So the bounded rationality says that humans do not want to do a lot of computation. You understand simple mechanisms, you understand simple mechanisms, you can do whatever computation you want to do in your brain, and you, sh you want to act, okay? You don't want to spend time doing all this complicated density functions, distributions, and so on. When you go and buy a bunch of spinach or a, or a few uh, packs of uh, juice or whatever, right? So you don't want to do all of that on a day-to-day -day basis. So in some sense, when you talk about this welfare maximization and whatnot, you are implicitly assuming that everybody is interested in maximizing the social welfare no matter what the computational cost is going to be, and that's not the case. Okay, so somehow, if you could account for the cost of computation, the mental computation that we have to go through in order to uh, react in these mechanisms, and then you do social welfare maximization, you will probably come up with simpler mechanisms as the optimal auction mechanisms, okay? Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but Okay, so the cost of computation is not there as part of the welfare maximization. And what I'm saying is it should be there, okay? And in which case, the simpler mechanisms would become the optimal solution. So I want to talk about profit inequality. The setting is as follows. Uh, you are in an N stage game. N stage game. Uh, you are seeing the distribution G1. So at, at time I, take reward pi I, which is distributed according to GI and leave and exit the game or proceed to time i plus one. Okay, so that's the game. I put you in a game and at every point of time, at time one, I come up with this 
CDF G1, I pick a reward pi i. Pi i has to be greater than or equal to 0. So pi i has to be greater than or equal to 0. I pick a reward according to the CTF, CDF G i. And you have to decide, you as a decision maker has to decide whether to take the reward and exit the game or to proceed to the next time, okay? So wait for a better reward to come in the future. Okay, this is pretty, very similar to job market, okay? So whether to take the current job that you have or decline the job offer and move on or, and go for the next interview, okay? You might get a better reward in the future. So, so what profit inequality says that G1 to Gn independent pick T such that the probability of max over i pi i greater than or equal to t is equal to 1 half. And the strategy is take the reward if pi i is greater than or equal to t. Okay, so a threshold based so this is a threshold based strategy. This is threshold based strategy, okay? So you're going for N job interviews, you got an offer, they told you what your salary or what your package is, and you have this threshold rule, well, if my salary is above $100,000, I'll take the job, otherwise I won't go for the job, okay? It turns out that the expected reward then, expected reward is greater than or equal to half of the expected value of max i pi i. Okay, so max i pi i is what you can get, the maximum reward that you can get in this particular game at the end of the game, okay? If you knew exactly when to stop. But if you use this threshold-based strategy, which is a very simple strategy, okay? In order to get this max i of pi i, you really need to know a lot, okay? What you're going to see in the future, what you have seen in the past, come up with uh, some sort of probability uh, uh, measures, do concentration of measures, and then figure out, okay, when to stop. Very difficult problem to solve, okay? However, there is a simpler strategy, which is a threshold-based strategy, which will guarantee you at least half of the maximum reward you can potentially get. Okay. Isn't that cool? Okay. So, simplicity is the key here. A simple strategy that gives you at least half of the maximum reward you can potentially get in the expected sense. So how do you apply that profit inequality in this setting? Well, how do you actually prove this? Well, the key step in the proof is as follows. You essentially prove that the expected reward with the threshold t is actually less than or equal to t plus summation i equals 1 to n expected value of pi i minus t plus. Okay, so this plus is you take the max of 0 and pi i minus t, okay? And then this is less than half of 
t plus summation i equals 1 to n expected value of pi i minus t plus. Okay, so you, you find this expected reward, you bound it above by some value, and then you bound it below by half of that value. Okay, so that guarantees you to get this expected reward. Oh, sorry, actually, so that's one thing, sorry, this is one inequality, and the other inequality is expected value of max i pi i is less than equal to t plus summation i equals 1 to n pi i minus t plus. Okay, so you lower bound the expected reward and then you upper bound the expected of maximum reward and then you see that this is twice of this. Okay, so that's how you get this inequality. Is that clear? So how does, yeah, any question? No? Okay, so that's the proof technique here. Uh, how does that help us in this particular problem? So step one, remember I wanted to come up with simpler mechanism for this, this problem. So step one is to understand the expected value of summation of phi i v, f phi i v i, f i v, this is the expected, expected reward. That's equal to the expected value of summation i equals 1 to n phi i v plus and multiplied by f i v. Okay. Why is this supposed to be true? Well, if the virtual valuation is negative, you won't allocate any resource to that particular person. right? Because then you are going to reduce the expected revenue. So you don't want to allocate resource to a person whose ex virtual valuation is negative. I mean, you'll just, if you give him zero, uh, zero, if you allocate him zero resource or zero item, you will actually improve your revenue. So that's one thing. And then step two, pick T as probability of max phi i vi plus greater than equal to t equals one half. Okay. And then when you run the auction, step three, allocate the item. Remember, this was single item auction. So allocate the item to I not satisfying phi I not V I not plus greater than or equal to t. Okay, if you have multiple such i naughts, just pick one at random. Doesn't matter who you pick. Okay. None. Sorry? If there are none, it could yes, there could be cases when there are none, so you solve those problems separately. Okay, so in this is under the assumption that there will always be some, sometimes you could not even find this, you cannot even find a, a value of t such that this probability will be equal to one half. Okay, so, um, 
So there are, of course, boundary cases that you have to uh, work on it separately. It's not part of the, the results that are given in the book. This is under the assumption that everything works out nicely in this setting. Okay, so what's the benefit of this uh, way of allocating the item to a person? Well, it's a threshold-based allocation rule, and it guarantees you a reward which is at least half of the maximum reward you can potentially get by running a more complicated auction. Okay? So that's the benefit of this, uh, this type of uh, allocation rule. So overall, what, what I want to tell you as part of this very brief lecture on algorithmic mechanism design, which is a huge field in itself, is that DSIC is important, but there are other tools that you can play around so as to, so as to come up with a, a strategy, an allocation and payment strategy that allows you to do what you want to do, okay, but may not give you so it gives you certain guarantee, okay? It's not completely ad hoc. If you just run some heuristic algorithm to solve the social welfare maximization problem, you won't be able to get anywhere, anywhere a result of this sort, okay? A result of a sort that is simple, easy to understand, implementable, and gives you guarantee on what your expected revenue is going to be like and what's your expected payoff and what's your Expected, expected social welfare is going to be like, okay? So that's, that's very important. So typically what you do is you massage this allocation function a little bit so as to make it monotone, then you come up with the payment policy approximately, and then you uh, run the auction and gives you very, very good payoff, okay? It doesn't, may not give you the maximum payoff, but it gives you good enough payoff that you can be as big as Google or Facebook or Yahoo. Well, Yahoo is not big now, but in their heydays, they were the company to work for, okay? So, how many of you know that Yahoo was supposed to be, Yahoo was supposed to acquire Google at some point of time, but that negotiation fell off, okay? <laughs> and then, that was early 2000, maybe 2001, 2002, somewhere around that time. And then Google, of course, went and did what they, uh, what they did and became a big company. So that's all I have for today. Uh, next class, I want to talk about, I forgot what, oh, the routing problems, okay.